No moi ja hyvää Runebergin päivää. Happy Runeberry Day. It's Mikko and I have yet another old slideshow for you guys. And this one is about the greatest pastry like ever. So let's roll it. And this greatest pastry of all time is named after the national poet of Finland, Johan Ludwig Runeberg. Now, who is this guy? So he lived in the 1800s. He is the national poet of Finland. And there's an annual flag day that's dedicated to Mr. Runeberg. It's on February 5th, which is why I uploaded this video today. And he's known for many things, but one of the... He, most famous of his works is the poem Wordland in the collection of poems called Tales of Ensign Stall. And it is the first poem of that book and it is used as the lyrics of the national anthem. So you go to Finland to work as an OFW. Why should you care about this national poet dude? Well, let me tell you why. And it's also in the video description. Because around Runeberry Day on February 5th, nationwide, you will see these dedicated pastries in stores. Or you can make them yourself and they are super, super yummy. And they look like this. They are called Runeberin Tortu in Finnish. I'll talk about the pastry itself a little later. First, I'll give you some background information as to why this dude is important and what the historical setting ar uh, around his time was. So here are 11 slides of background info as to why a dude who only wrote in Swedish is now the national poet of Finland. Okay, so here's a map of Northern Europe and uh, the borders of Sweden in 1721 in, uh, superimposed over the current present day borders. So this is what it looked in 1721. And here is Sweden roughly 100 years later. Something is missing, right? The eastern part of Sweden, present day Finland is gone. Something happened. So the present day Finland was the eastern part of Sweden for several hundred years. Uh, but then it was annexed by Russia in the Finnish war or Suomen Sota in 1809. And the war happened because at that time France was pretty much at war with everybody. And especially the what is known today as the United Kingdom, the British Isles. And France started a continental blockade in 1706 in order to cut off trade and supplies to the United Kingdom from the continental Europe. Here's a map. So the red areas are part of the continental blockade. And the blue parts are the Swedish Empire, which is not part of the continental blockade, effectively making the blockade pretty useless since there's a large portion of areas that still trade or have provide access to the United Kingdom, or I mean the area of the present day United Kingdom. So the Swedish king at the time was a little superstitious and he thought that the French emperor was like the devil himself or something pretty close to it. And Sweden didn't want to have anything to do with this naval blockade. And I guess the Swedish king was not that far off with his guess because the dude at the helm of France at the time was Napoleon Bonaparte, who, among other questionable things, wanted to conquer the entire Europe. And he was not happy about this thingy at all, that thingy being Sweden not being part of the blockade. So Russian Emperor and Mr. Napoleon, they are friends, they get along, but Russia is a lot closer to Sweden than France is. So Napoleon wants Russia to force Sweden into this blockade against the British Isles. And the Russian Emperor is like, what do I do? And Napoleon is like, well, we couldn't do it through diplomacy, so maybe we should force the issue. So you go and conquer that eastern part of Sweden, you silly. And the Russian Emperor is like, okay, I'll do it. And then he goes and conquers the eastern province of Sweden, which is the area of present-day Finland. And that is the conflict of the Finnish War of 1809 that I showed the map earlier, where Sweden lost a big portion of its former territories. So in 1809, when this happens, Finland has already been culturally, militarily and legislatively part of Sweden for almost 600 years since the Middle Ages onwards. And now all of that changes, the area of Finland becomes part of Russia. 
but Finland is not taken over completely. It becomes an autonomous Russian Grand Duchy. In Finnish it's called Suomen suuri ruhtinaskunta, which gets to keep its money and its legislative practices and even has self-governance to some extent. And this period lasts roughly 100 years until end of World War I, when Finland declares independence during the Russian Revolution in 1917. So after and before uh, Russia takes over, the upper class of Finland has been Swedish-speaking, and most of them remain in Finland when Finland becomes part of Russia. And even though it's now part of Russia, Finland is still ruled and governed by the same people, the Swedish-speaking upper class. But most of the general population in the area, they still consist of unlettered common folk like peasants, farmers, and they speak this strange language, unsuitable for any modern governance or scientific purposes or high poetry or literature, this language being Finnish. So at this point, the Swedish-speaking upper class is culturally kind of in a tricky situation because they can no longer be part of Sweden, but they absolutely don't want to become Russians either. So it's not looking good, right? And what to do, what to do goes the thinking process. I mean, this is an oversimplification, of course. And at this point, a wave of nationalism sweeps across the Russian Empire and the Swedish-speaking upper class gets an idea that let's just be Finns then. There's increased interest towards native Finnish folk and their oral traditions and their customs and their language. And Runeberg's works helped to spark this initial interest. But then various Russification of efforts by the Russian government also helped because they spark anger towards the throne and, and towards the Russian government. Here is a painting by Eduard Isto called Hyökkäys literally an assault, uh, from that period there's a Russian two-headed eagle tearing down a law book that is held by the Finnish maiden, which is like the personification of Finland. So this leads to interest towards Finnish language, and some people change their Swedish last names into Finnish last names, or they translate them into Finnish, and overall nationalistic themes start to show up in all forms of art. Okay, now I know this is pretty abstract, but this is second to last of these history slides. Then we get to Runeberg himself, so stay awake. Okay, so this Runeberg guy is important because he was at the forefront when this idea of Finland as a nation state started to emerge. But this was pretty much a top-down project, mostly by the Swedish-speaking upper class and university people. This was not some all-encompassing idea that reached every corner of the Grand Duchy. Because common peasants at the time were probably more interested in just getting by and finding enough food for next winter rather than listening to the grand ideas of Finland as a nation-state. Okay, so what about this Runeberg guy himself? Well... His life is maybe not nearly as interesting or important as the cultural and historic context around him, but I'll say a few words about the man himself. So he was born in the early 1800s to a uh, Swedish-speaking upper class, and he would write in Swedish. He studied uh, literature at the Imperial Academy of Turku, which is the present-day University of Helsinki, and he and he actually enrolled in the same year as the national philosopher and a statesman Johan Wilhelm Snellman and uh, Elias Lönnrot, who was also an important promoter of Finnish nationalism and compiled, for example, the national epic The Kalevala. So after Mr. Runeberg graduated, he landed a teaching job in Saarjärvi, located in central Finland, roughly around this area. And this is an important point in his career as a poet because he hangs out there with native Finnish folk in rural Saarjärvi and for whatever reason he totally falls in love with the local Finnish peasantry and from these encounters becomes this romanticized idea of native Finns which Mr. Runeberg then repeats all over in his written works. So in his works Finnish people are often seen as a little simple-minded, but then men of few words, they don't talk much, but they are really hard-working, they are honest, they always tell you the truth. They are God-fearing people, they love their neighbor, and of course they live in harmony with the nature. 
So these are like stereotypical characters in Mr. Runeberry's works. And these stereotypes that he writes become a repeated trope in Finnish literature during the nationalistic period, and to some extent the stereotype still lives on. And he was a well-respected author during his lifetime, and his work saw even more admiration after his death, especially during World War II, when there was need for nationalistic Finnish narratives or narratives about what Finnish soldiers should be like and so on. But then after World War II, when these overly nationalistic ideas kind of backfire, or once people see what, what kind of horrible things they can lead to, these overly idealized images of like native Finns and Finnish soldier and the way he romanticizes war kind of faces criticism. Here is one of his key works, or the Finnish translation of it. He, he wrote it in Swedish, obviously, but this is uh, The Tales of Ensign Stål of Andrikki Stål in Tarinat. So it's an epic poem where the narrator, old Ensign Stål, talks about his experience in the Finnish War of 1809 to a university student who is kind of interviewing him, setting these stories in motion in the narrative. It was commonly used in schools and it includes real and fictional characters from the Finnish War or that era kind of depicts the officers as sometimes a little sketchy and untrustworthy, while grassroots level soldiers are like courageous and a little simple-minded, but do their bidding for the state. Okay, so is this Runeberg guy a good guy, or did he just write outdated over in nationalistic stuff? Well, he's kind of a victim of this post-World War mindset that tends to be critical towards enthusiastic nationalism in Europe because that led to like World War II and Holocaust and all the horrible stuff that Europe went through and put the rest of the world through and would rather not repeat the same mistake again. So sometimes Rune Bar Barry's works are downplayed because of this us versus them mentality in them. But, but at the time of their publication, this guy, uh, the way he presented these native Finnish characters, it was like a very respectful and completely new approach in Finnish literature. And he also uses like poetic devices from ancient Greek tradition to depict uh, these common Finnish folk. And it was also something that was kind of unheard of at the time. He's a respected author in Scandinavia as well, and not just in Finland. But let's get back to the point here. So the pastry. So these pastries were first made by his wife, Fredrika, and she was an established poet as well, but the but she was totally overshadowed by her husband, whose works saw a lot more lime, uh, time in the limelight than hers did. But anyway, the legend goes that she put these pastries together from whatever she had in her pantry and the outcome was this cylinder-shaped sweet pastry, and it has almond or rum or arak as a flavor. And at the top, there's raspberry jam and then white sugar frosting ring around the jam. You can buy these at the stores or you can make them on your own. It's pretty basic ingredients. Here's a summary of everything we've discussed. So this dude is important because he was alive and writing at the time. Finland was transforming into a European nation-state in the late 1800s. And the stereotypes that he wrote about, about ethnic Finns, these are still alive to some extent. So if you ask a, an average person about stereotypical Finn, they will probably say, oh, they're a little quiet, don't do much small talk, but they are super honest, and if you become their friend, they are friend for life, and so on. And nature is important for them and so on. So so it's the same stuff Runeberg kind of set in motion in his poems in the 1800s. And this is kind of like part of the national narrative. So some people <laughs> like you if you repeat these kind of tropes to them. I mean, obviously, no guarantees. It's just a stereotype. And the pastry is yummy. And unlike the salted licorice that I mentioned in the video about Finnish food, this one is not weird in any way. The Runeberg tortu tastes like a normal pastry. If you like sweet pastries, you love that one as well. And you can see streets named after Runeberg, as well as statues of him around the country. In the last slide, I have a picture of one. This is located in downtown Helsing in the Esplanade Park. And this is the winter version. Mr. Runeberg there at the top. 
Okay, and that's all I have about Mr. Runeberry. So once you are in Finland and it's February, go and get those pastries or make them yourself. They are really yummy. And if you're super interested, there are English translations available of his works. So go and find them online or at the local library. And that is all I have for you today. Kiitos paljon. Nähdään.